Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you all. God's blessed us with another day of beautiful weather. Can you guys hear me up there all right? Yes, sir. All righty, perfect. We got uh, a group staying up there as the grass was slick this morning. They didn't want to slip coming down. Um, so it works out well. So we got some people over there. Everybody say hi to the people over there. All you guys say hi to everybody over here. Hi. And there we go. <laughs> so we have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, first off, uh, last Tuesday morning, we uh, started up our ladies' Bible study again. And that's Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, we'd love to have you ladies come out and join us. We are going through a survey of the Old Testament. Um, and so we'd like to have you uh, ladies come out and join us. And for the time being, we're just meeting out in the picnic shelter if the weather cooperates. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll meet inside and we'll social distance and all of that good stuff. Um, next announcement, uh, youth group Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Uh, that's for the youth 6th uh, grade on up. Love to see all of you youth out there. Uh, then the last announcement that I have uh, this morning is uh, our church is sponsoring Northwestern Lunch for Band Camp this upcoming week. We did one this past week. I missed that. Uh, Jamie's family was in town. But we're doing another one this week. What, what day was it, Karen? Thursday. Thursday. So uh, Karen posted uh, a, a list of stuff we needed uh, to provide for the lunch on Thursday uh, to be uh, a helping hand to show our love towards our community. So Thursday, uh, we are providing lunch for Northwestern Checkout. Uh, if you want to donate, see Karen or, or check out the Facebook page and you can see the information there. Karen, what time is that? 11.30. Do, we, do you still need more volunteers to assist? Perfect. So yes, we, we need food and also if you'd like to volunteer, uh, see Karen as well. So those are all the announcements that we have this morning. So we'll go ahead and we will turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Father, we thank you for this gorgeous weather out here this morning. I thank you for uh, letting the sun uh, be out and shining this morning. Uh, Father, your creation is just so beautiful. Father, I just pray uh, that you are glorified, that you are honored this morning, uh, and I pray that you are given all the praise uh, that, that you so much deserve. Um, and Father, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As you'll notice, uh, Jen, uh, our, our usual worship leader, is uh, not here this week as well as her husband Brian and her, their family. They're at a Church of God camp out over in Indiana. A lot of families uh, that go to uh, family camp in the summer, they uh, go out camping later on. Um, and so that's where Brian and Jen are at this morning. So you guys are stuck with me. I'm sorry to say that. Um, <laughs> soon you guys will be all the more appreciative of Brian and Jen and Karen as well. Um, as you, again, you guys are stuck with me today. So to start off this morning, uh, we're going to be singing Open Up the Heavens. Uh, it should be on your sheet. Uh, raise your hand if you need uh, the lyrics as Neil have them. I don't see her, though. She, she's up there. She, yeah, she's waving her hand. Neil, you want to come? Oh, thank you, Ben. So raise your hand when Ben comes down here to give you a, an order of service and the lyrics as well. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to sing Open Up the Heavens. Lord, unveil our eyes. Your 
Amen. Very good. And we'll continue with Broken Vessels, Amazing Grace. in our service. Uh, we provide, provide a time uh, for you guys to share any prayer requests or praises that you may have. Does anybody have any prayer requests or praise that, that, that they would like to share? Yes, Debbie? Um, I would like prayers for my aunt, Maria Queen. Um, my uncle died, uh, so just keep her in your thoughts and prayers. Absolutely. Thank you. That was Phil Queen, who we've been praying for the past couple of weeks. What a stinker. <laughs> Karen? Uh, or, yeah. Um, a lot of you know Dennis Severs. Uh, Paula called this morning. Dennis had a seizure yesterday, and I don't know how bad it was, but he, uh, he had a seizure, and I'm sure that uh, you know, they, could have, they would appreciate prayers for that, that he'd you know, be alright and get back up on his feet, so get going. So. Absolutely. I also have a praise. Uh, this past week was General Conference, and uh, 
was all online this year, but uh, there was a, uh, I thought our church uh, represented itself very well. Um, Alan Kane gave a, uh, a message the other night. One of his uh, main points as he started off was he talked about a man named Stan Rao. And Stan, <laughs> Stan had, uh, he'd gone back and he talked about how when they were little kids, when Stan was a kid, he had invited one of his buddies, a, a guy by the name of Rex Kane, to Lawrenceville Church. And they had gone there and, uh, <coughs> it, well, because of, of Stan, uh, Rex then, in the Lawrenceville Church, they kind of loved on him. And he found Christ, and now his, his sons, and now their sons are actively involved in the Church of God. And it's just, it was a, a beautiful testimony uh, for Rex Kane, but also for Stan. So, Stan, thank you. you. You always represent our church well, and and we're proud of you, and, and thank you, Stan, for... It's not just uh, that, you know, Rex Kane, but many other people along the way that you guys have shepherded along, and, and uh, that was just a wonderful testimony for our church, but also for for uh, a godly man like Stan. So, thank you, Stan. Thank you, Stan. Rex's grandson is my brother-in-law, so if it weren't for Stan, I wouldn't have had my brother-in-law, Josiah Kane. So, Stan, oh boy, we got problems here. <laughs> I'm kidding, I love Josiah. One thing I'd like to add to that, when Rex and I was about ready to leave school and so forth, we both went and talked to Reverend Smith about what we should do. And he said, Rex, you should become a preacher. Stan, you should go to the telephone company. <laughs> <laughs> and you both listen. <laughs> well, I don't know why he told me that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes, Kirsten. Absolutely. Sorry to hear that. I have a praise. Yes, Missy. My brother got to come home Thursday from the hospital. He's been in there quite a while. And I got to go spend the day with him yesterday, which was wonderful to you know, get to share things with him that he's missed out on. But he's still not real strong, not walking a lot. And... Um, Needs a lot of prayer. So, uh, Robert Cooper, I asked for him a lot. So, <laughs> I got one thing. My nephew and niece that were tested for the virus, I guess it's been three weeks now. They're back to work, and I guess it might have been a false positive. I don't know, but they're fine now. Praise God. It can be scary stuff. Karen? So yesterday the twins turned 13. So I guess that's a praise, but at the same time I need prayer requests. I got three teenagers. <laughs> so and then we're also moving out of our home that we've been in for 14 years this weekend, and uh, moving to mom and dad's house between the camper and their house, and eight people sharing a shower for the next six or seven months. It's going to be an interesting life. So lots of prayer requests. I think for everybody. Eight people with three teens. Full of drama. We can make a soap opera out of the Vi and Jones family there. Yes, Debbie? Um, I just like prayers for all the teachers that are going to be doing whatever. Um, as a retired teacher, um, I really want to keep them in my thoughts and prayers. Yeah, absolutely. This is a scary, scary time for them. Yes, yes Brett? The guy that I work with, his name's Victor, and he didn't feel right and ended up going home. This has been about a month ago, and they uh, he went to the hospital here in Springfield, and for three weeks he sat there and they could not figure out what was wrong with him. 
So they ended up making an appointment for him to go to the Cleveland Clinic, and they said he's got pinched nerves in both of his legs and he cannot walk. Excellent. So prayers for Victor. Hope that they figure out what they're going to do because the, the surgeons don't even know what they're going to do about it. So just prayers for healing. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm under the tree. Yes, Anita. Uh, continued prayers for John. We're going to be getting some second opinions, uh, and hopefully he'll uh, feel a little stronger. But he's a good guy and just wanting to get well. Yes. We've missed John. Uh, oh, he can't even. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and another a good thought. I'm glad that we're doing our service outside since you're sharing one shower with eight people. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Next week, we better pray God holds back the rain. <laughs> or bring me some soap. <laughs> Any other prayer requests or praises? I got. A, I yes. didn't hear it mentioned last week, but praise for our new racetrack. Yes. Uh, nobody mentioned that last week, but last <coughs> week, and boy, is it nice. It is nice. It is nice. We mentioned it two weeks ago two with weeks. the anonymous donor. Uh, that was yeah, a yeah, huge yeah. blessing yeah. and a huge oh, praise nice. there. Um, as again. Uh, our project was delayed a week. We didn't really hear back from Meads, the pavement people, which caused me to get frustrated. It's like they weren't communicating with us, but it, it ended up being God working through it all because we had an anonymous donor um, who uh, provided funds to finish off uh, the parking lot over there. So God is good, uh, and, and he works through his children. So amen. Thank you, Larry. Any other prayer requests or praises? Looking up there, making sure they don't all have their hands raised. Well, very good. We'll go ahead and we will turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. So if you'll bow with me. Father, again, I just thank you for bringing us all here this morning, uh, that we can gather together as your church, as your family. Uh, Father, I just uh, pray uh, that you heard uh, you, you did hear all of these requests, and Father, I just pray that you work in and through all of these uh, different unique situations and circumstances. Uh, Father, I just uh, pray that ultimately everyone uh, can seek you first and foremost, whether they are uh, in a time of need or in a time of celebration. Father, I pray that we turn to you in, in, in times of need and that we rejoice with you and give you praise and thanks in, in times of celebration. Father, I just thank you so much again for this beautiful weather. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful church family here. And I just pray that ultimately we can continue to grow closer to you and expand your coming kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Very good. So before we go ahead with the message this morning, we'll go ahead and we will sing uh, one more song. Uh, and it's called Waymaker. It's a new song here. Many of you guys are probably uh, well familiar with it as it's a pretty uh, popular song on the Christian uh, radio. Um, but the chorus reads, You are the waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. And, and just a reminder that we serve a good, good God. He, he has infinite power, infinite knowledge, uh, he, and he is full of love. He is a good and gracious God, and that is the God that we serve that is in our midst. So let's go ahead and let's sing the Waymaker. Oh, well. 
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Amen. Got so many wires going on here. Yes, I'm on. Well, very good. It is, uh, again, it's good to see you all uh, this morning. Um, ever since moving here uh, to Ohio in the past year and a half, I've really hardly uh, ever uh, played my guitar. So it's good to worship God um, in that way. Uh, as, as I like worshiping God and music, uh, as I'm sure many of you guys do as well. Uh, this past week, we were blessed, uh, Jamie and I, uh, to have Jamie's family uh, come visit us for a couple of days uh, this past week. And we always love the opportunities when our family gets to come visit or we get to go uh, visit our family. But it feels so depressing and lonely when they all, uh, when they all do leave. Um, but So I'm glad to be able to be with you all here this morning, our church family, and help uh, me get over that depression and, and loneliness of our families. Leave. I'm kidding. I'm being dramatic. Uh, that's what my wife says a lot. You're being dramatic, uh, just like the the three uh, teenagers. I'm sure. I'm sure in the Vi family, uh, full of drama. Uh, but really, it is good uh, to be with you all uh, this morning. Uh, it's good to praise God together. Give God the praise and worship out here in His beautiful creation. So on occasion, I like to go back and I like to look at uh, pictures of Ezra when he was a little baby. Go all the way back to when we were in the hospital for three weeks and, and when he was all the way down to five and a half pounds or even a bit less at his low point to where now he, he's over 17 pounds. And it's hard for me to imagine three plus Ezra's fitting into the one baby Ezra way back there, nine month old Ezra. He seems, still seems like a small baby to me. Uh, last doctor uh, visit, he was in the second percentile of height which is up from like 0.6 or whatever the appointment before then. So we're making gains. There we go, buddy. Uh, but back in December, so uh, about a month and a half uh, after Ezra was born, Jamie had a mini uh, photo session with her family and Ezra. And Ben, could you hand me that canvas on the table? Yes, I, I like to look back and, and see the pictures of Ezra when he was a little baby. I'm not sure how well you can see this. This is a canvas uh, that Jamie's mother uh, got uh, for her so that we could hang up in our apartment. Um, it's yet to be hung up in our apartment. Uh, but uh, when we move into a house, I'm sure this will make it up on the walls. As I love looking at pictures of, sorry to say this, but my two favorite people here on earth, my beautiful wife Jamie and my adorable baby Ezra. And and uh, he, he's come a long ways. And so on the count of three, everyone say, oh, one, two, three. Aww. Ah, that's Aww. right. Oh, what a beautiful wife and an adorable baby that I have. God has blessed me, that is for sure. 
So I enjoy looking at pictures uh, like that. But you know, it's kind of difficult to hold a conversation with that picture. You know, I, I can't talk to it. When I talk to that picture of my, the two favorite people, my two favorite people in this world, you know, it's kind of like talking to a wall. You know, I, I get no response. And it's just not the same when I talk to my wife back there and my baby Ezra. Because when I talk to them back there, I get some response and I'm able to communicate with them. And, and they're able to talk back with me. But when I talk with that canvas, you know, it's kind of boring because I get no response. Be because that's not really Jamie and Ezra. You know, we all know that's just a picture of Jamie and Ezra. They, they are two very distinct things. My wife walking back there with the baby and this picture here of Jamie and Ezra. They are two very distinct objects. This is a representation. The picture is a representation of my wife and my baby, Jamie. They are not the same. They, they are two different objects. And today we're going to be talking about how Jesus represents God and how Jesus is the image of God and, and, and how maybe that, that shows that there's some sort of distinction between God and his son, Jesus. And so today our, our sermon is entitled, Jesus, the Supreme Agent of God. And I'm going to give you guys a little warning in advance. So what we're going to talk about uh, this morning uh, is something that uh, some scholars will take note of, but it's not something that the, the typical Christian will really take note of because it's kind of a scholarly thing to talk about, talking about agency, as Jesus is the supreme agent of God. So I'm going to try to describe it in as simple terms as possible, and I believe in you guys that you can get uh, a firm foundation in, in this understanding as Jesus serving as the supreme agent of God. Before we, we talk more about agency, I want to talk about how Jesus is the image of God. So Jesus serves as a wonderful image or representation of God, just like this picture serves as a wonderful uh, image or representation of Jamie and Ezra. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, uh, it, it reads, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So here Paul, as he's writing uh, th this letter of Colossians, he says that the Son, that is the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So Jesus is the image of God. You know, here Paul, Paul describes Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, as the invisible God. As, I don't know about you, but I have not seen God with my own two eyes, his physical being, his physical body, his physical face. So that's why uh, Paul describes him as the invisible God. And so here Paul says that Jesus is the image of God. In other words, Jesus represents God. God. Again, just like the picture of Jamie and Ezra represents the real Jamie and Ezra back there, Jesus, the Son of God, is the image of God. So they are separate, but Jesus serves as a representation or image of his Father. Because if you, you, you can't be something and the image of that something. Let me say that again. You, you can't be something or someone and be the image of that someone or something. Just like that is not Jamie and Ezra. That's just a representation of the true Jamie and Ezra back there. So Jesus is the image of God. Well, that should give us a pretty good indicator. That should give us a pretty good clue that Jesus is distinct from God. Since he is the image of God, you, you can't be the image of something and be that actual thing. And so this term of someone representing another or kind of being the image of someone else is known as agency, as we kind of gave a clue earlier this morning, as we're talking about Jesus, the supreme agent of God. So when someone represents another person, that is what's called agency. And we talked a bit about this topic of agency in our Tuesday morning ladies Bible study and our youth group. Um, and, and again, it can be a, a bit difficult uh, of a concept to grasp, but I think we can all, if we're paying attention, listening intently this morning, I think that we can all come away um, with, with a good idea of what the concept of agency is all about. And if you have a good concept of what agency is all about, let me tell you, you'll be far ahead of the game compared to uh, the, the typical Christian here living uh, in this world. 
So I'm gonna, again, I'm going to try to explain uh, agency in as simple terms as possible. But the Encyclopedia of Jewish Religion defines being an agent as, quote, the main point of the Jewish law of agency is expressed in the dictum, a person's agent is regarded as the person himself. Therefore, any act committed by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal. And I bring up this encyclopedia of Jewish religion because I, I just don't want you guys to think this is something that I'm coming up with. That, and that's, that's not the case at all. This is something uh, that I was taught at the Atlanta Bible College even a bit before then. This is something uh, that the encyclopedia of Jewish religion, you know, uh, the Jews who, who hold to the Old Testament scripture. This is something that, that maybe your everyday Christian that you encounter aren't too familiar with. But a scholar probably should be familiar with the term agency. As again, it, it's pointed out here in the encyclopedia of Jewish religion and they, they, they gave a, a kind of a long complicated definition of what it means to be an agent but in other words an agent represents the person he or she is appointed by or works for so if you have an agent they are representing you as you are not able to be present in that situation and th this definition uh, uh, of agency or being an agent and the Encyclopedia of Jewish Religion continues and it says, Therefore, any act committed by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal. So in other words, in more simple terms, uh, what, what that's kind of saying is if an agent commits an act, if that agent commits an act, then it could be regarded that the principal or the one who appointed the, the agent, it could be considered that they were the one who committed it. So here an agent can say something or an agent can do something and, and really that, that can in the end mean that this person who appointed this agent said that or did this. Let, let me provide an example this morning that I think will help you kind of understand this. Let's say I work for the FBI and, and I am in pursuit of, uh, I'll pick on Mark over here. Mark committed some grave criminal and, and Mark's gone, run away. And so I'm an FBI agent and I'm in pursuit of, of chasing down Mark. Mark is hiding in his little hideout. And after many hours of tracing down where Mark, th this, this bad criminal, is, uh, I finally trace him down into his little hideout. And so me as the FBI agent, I go knocking on Mark's door and I say, open up, this is the FBI. You'll notice that, that I wouldn't say, open up, this is Agent McClain. I say, open up, this is the FBI. Now me, I'm not, I'm not the FBI in its entirety, but me, I represent the FBI. So I can rightfully knock on, on Mark's door and say, open up, this is the FBI. And when I do that, when I say open up, this is the FBI, I, all of a sudden I have much more authority and power. Rather than just knocking on his door and say open up, this is Agent McClain. But when I say open up, this is the FBI, that, 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 could, that could be a true statement as I am just a representation of the FBI. I'm not the FBI in its entirety, but I'm a representation of the FBI. So again, an agent is someone who represents someone else. You can think of it like an FBI or a police officer when they go knocking on someone's door. They say, open up, this is the police, or open up, this is the FBI. You know, they don't say their names. They, they, they say uh, the, the agency that, that they are representing because all of a sudden it gives them a lot more authority and a lot more power. And sometimes... When an agent is appointed or hired or, or however it, it may come about, sometimes they can even be given the name or the title of the person they are representing. Just like when I can go knock on the door and say, open up, this is the FBI. So back in, in the time that the Bible uh, was written, thousands of years ago, it, it, it covered a, a large chunk of time. But back when the Bible was written, this idea of agency was much more common. Because back then... They didn't have use of the telephone, they didn't have use of cars, they didn't have use uh, of uh, uh, airplanes or helicopters or any of that, the internet, nothing. And so they had to resort to, if someone wanted to deliver a message to someone, you know, a king or something, they, they would send a messenger or an agent in their name to go deliver a message. 
But us today, you know, we have vehicles, we have the phone, we have the internet, and we can just deliver a message instantly, basically, to whoever we want in the entire world. And so that's kind of uh, re reduced uh, the, the need for agency, as we can often now just speak for ourselves. We, we don't need to appoint someone else to speak for ourselves. But in biblical times, uh, uh, it's important for us to, to take note that it would have been very common for the people to understand this idea of agency, even though it's a lot less common today. You know, a king could go and send a delegate or messenger, and they could speak for the king himself. So again, this is a, a common idea in the scriptures. And this morning, thank you. This morning, we're, we're, we're going to take a look at a biblical example of agency. And, and this is where it can maybe get a tiny bit confusing. As we're going to talk about the story that many of you guys are probably well familiar with, and I'm probably going to rock your world upside down. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, just the second book there. Exodus chapter 3. We're going to be talking about Moses and the burning bush. So again, this is a story that many of you guys are probably familiar with, a story that's often taught in Sunday school and so forth uh, to kids about Moses and the burning bush. Bush. And so before we talk about uh, this story and the possibility of agency taking place, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to read the first six verses of chapter 3 so we can kind of uh, remind ourselves of what the story of the burning bush is all about. So in Exodus chapter 3 verse 1 it reads, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law father Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to, to look at God. And so again, this is probably a story that many of you guys are uh, familiar with. Um, but it starts here in, in verse 1 talking about that Moses is the key figure here. Um, he's keeping the flock in, in his father-in-law's uh, pasture, Jethro. And when he's taking care of the flock in his father-in-law's uh, property, all of a sudden it says in verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And so verse 1 it introduces our, our first character here uh, in the story as Moses. And verse 2 it introduces the second figure in the story. And it describes him as an angel of the Lord. And it says this angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And so here after verse 2, we, we can see that Moses, he's taking care of his flock. And, and as he's taking care of uh, his father-in-law's flock, all of a sudden he sees a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning. He goes, hmm. That's not supposed to happen because when a tree or bush is on fire, usually it gets burnt up. So Moses goes and approaches uh, this bush and it said that it was an angel of the Lord who appeared to him in the midst of the bush. And then all of a sudden, if you jump down to, to verse 4, it says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. So, so this, this uh, again, is uh, very confusing because in verse 2, it says that it was an angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses in the bush. But now all of a sudden, verse 4, it says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. And yeah, it's possible that, uh, that God, you know, could have uh, been, been talking after the, the angel appeared um, in, in this story. But, but I think what, what's taking place here is this idea of agency. And I'm not alone in this thinking. As Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, if you want to flip there real quick to Acts chapter 7, 
Stephen was the first Christian martyr documented in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 7, in verses 30 and 35, um, Stephen describes what's taking place here in Exodus chapter 3. As Stephen, he is getting stoned to death. And so Acts chapter 7, it, it, it's a brilliant chapter. It's a long discourse of Stephen basically preaching to the people who are killing him. And he says in verse 30 of Acts chapter 7, this is Stephen, he says, Now when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him, that's Moses, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush. So here, uh, Stephen says that it was an angel who appeared to Moses. And then verse 35, we continue. Stephen then says, This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hands of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. So here, Stephen is saying that it was an angel who, who appeared uh, to Moses as well in Acts chapter 7. And I'm guessing that most of you guys, uh, when you were uh, told the, the story of Moses and the burning bush in Sunday school as a kid, uh, I'm guessing that in the drawings or whatever you talked about or in the kids' lesson, it probably talked about how God was talking to Moses within that bush. But, but again, I, I think maybe a more accurate uh, uh, reading or interpretation is the angel representing God in the burning bush. Bush. As again, this idea of agency was very well known, and it was an angel who appeared to, to Moses in the bush in, in, in chapter 2. And all of a sudden, the, the, this figure, this being in the bush, whoever it is, is saying that I am the God. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But yet, it was the angel who was present in the bush. So again, I think this is agency. And so Dustin Smith, a former professor at the Atlanta Bible College, he composed an article on his website listing the different examples of agency found in the scripture. It's on his website called biblicalunitarian.com, a great site to turn to for different articles written about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit talking about how our talk, preaching and teaching our distinct belief that we are biblical Unitarians. And in, in his article called Divine Agent Speaking and Acting on God's Dead, uh, he, he claims that agency is found all throughout uh, the Old Testament. And he provides uh, 11 different examples, and he gives proof through the scriptures to show that agency is taking place. We're, we're not going to go through all these stories, but I want to read off all these stories that Dustin shows through Scripture that agency is taking place. He says that agency is taking place between Hagar and the angel. So way back in Genesis, he says that there's agency in Sodom and Gomorrah, Jacob's dream, Jacob wrestles with God, Moses in the burning bush, angelic accompaniments in the wilderness and into the promised land, the Israelites and the angel, Gideon and the angel, Manoah and the angel, the angel and Joshua, the high priest, and before the Lord. So, so those were 11 different examples. I don't expect you uh, to, to know those uh, 11 ex examples. That's why I went through it quickly. But Dustin uses <coughs> biblical evidence to show that there were at least 11 instances of God deploying an agent, an agent found in the Old Testament. So 11 times God was represented by someone else in the Old Testament. And in some of these cases, some of these instances where, where these people are representing God, some of these instances, the, these people or these heavenly beings, they are actually called God. They, they are called God. And, and uh, at an initial glance, that can seem really alarming that other people outside of Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, are being called God in the Scriptures. When in Scriptures like Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says that, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it can seem like that goes directly contrast to these other Scriptures saying that these different people or heavenly beings are God Himself. But again, uh, what, what I think is taking place here is I think that the term of agency is being deployed here. <coughs> So again, I understand uh, that this is confusing. This is probably something uh, that you've not heard um, before, as not many people uh, really talk about. It. But I think it's important for us to understand in order to defend our faith of being biblical unitarians. You know, in order to defend our faith that God is one. 
and that there is no other being in the heavens and on the earth who is the almighty creator as God is one. That, that's the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the, the most important scripture to the Jews in the Old Testament, that God is one. And so these other beings being called God, that, that, that's not contradicting our faith that, that God is one. But what's taking place here is that these people are representing God and they actually forbid you take that title of God for a bit as God has deployed these agents to represent him. And so again, there's many different examples uh, of agency taking place throughout the scriptures. But the, the supreme agent that God deploys is Jesus himself. As Jesus is the great image of God, as Colossians 1.15 says that, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it reads, He, that, that's Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. So there are many agents in the Old Testament, but Jesus trumps them all. He is the Messiah that the Jews were looking for for thousands of years. He is the man that God planned to save mankind with. Now God and his son Jesus, they had a very close relationship. And Jesus spoke all that God commanded him to do. And so Jesus is the perfect supreme agent of God. He is the perfect representation of God. Because Jesus said everything that the Father wanted him to say. And so all of a sudden, uh, scriptures like Colossians 1.15 and Hebrews 1.3, all of a sudden we get this idea that, hey, yeah, Jesus is the perfect representation for us as to what God is like as far as his character, his good character, his love, and his mercy. And so that should not totally surprise us that in the New Testament, Jesus is in fact called God twice in the scripture. In John chapter 20, verse 28, uh, this is Jesus after the crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus approaches his disciples and he approaches his disciple Thomas, uh, known as the doubter. Um, but Thomas says in John uh, chapter 20, verse 28, it reads, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And boy, if you guys have approached uh, this passage on your own without understanding uh, this concept of agency, this can seem like a very, very difficult scripture to handle. As Thomas answered him saying, my Lord and my God. But if we have this idea of agency in our mind, then we can get this understanding, again, this understanding that was very common back in biblical times, that, hey, Thomas is saying that Jesus is representing the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. As Jesus does everything that his father tells him to, even to the point of the death on the cross. So Jesus is the perfect image, just like that image of Jamie and Ezra. Jesus is the perfect image of God. He is the perfect representation of God. And so when Thomas answers Jesus saying, my Lord and my God, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I'm not Thomas himself, I can't read his mind, but with reason, with much reason, I can assume that Thomas is talking about how Jesus is representing God through agency. As again, many different figures, many different people, kings, prophets, uh, heavenly beings in the Old Testament were called God as well. They're given the title of God as they are representing God. So John 20, chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus called God. And then also in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Uh, we're not really going to delve too much into it, uh, but this is also quoted from Psalm 45, which is about a king and not God. So, so another instance where someone else is called God. But one way in which we can explain this verse as biblical Unitarians, we can explain that here again, Jesus represents God. As Jesus is the perfect image and the perfect representation of God. As Jesus is the supreme agent of God. He did everything that his father asked him to do. His father is where Jesus receives all of his power 
and authority from. You know, John chapter 5, verse 19 sums it up pretty well. We won't, we won't turn there. But it reads, uh, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So Jesus uh, told this group of people that, hey, I can do nothing on my own accord. I only do what I see my Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So without God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is nothing. But with God, Jesus is everything, man. He is the perfect representation of God. He is our Lord and Savior. God has handed that power and authority over to Jesus. And so Jesus, on his own, he can do nothing of his own accord. But he does what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So Jesus, again, is the perfect agent of God. The supreme agent of God. The perfect representation of God. And so again, agency is a scholarly term that not too many people are familiar with. Um, we, as again, we don't really use agency too much in, in our common uh, lives today. As again, we have access to vehicles, we have access to phones, the access to the internet. We don't really need to, do, to, to use agency in our lives. But 2,000 plus years ago, that was a totally different story. And it was very, very common for the people in their ordinary lives to deploy agency, to send someone else to represent them in a situation or circumstances that they, that they aren't able to be present in. And so they would have been well familiar with this term that Jesus is an agent of God, or that the, the angel in Exodus chapter 3 is an agent of God, or, or all these different examples that the king in Psalm 45 is, is an agent of God. They would have been well familiar with it. And so we have to be careful when we're reading through the scriptures that were written 2,000 years plus ago. We have to be careful and take note of the historical context and realize what their culture and society was like when they were writing these different books of the Bible. And if we do that, we can come away with a better idea, a better understanding of this idea of agency. As again, this is not something that, that I came up with. Uh, this is something I, I've heard from people much smarter than myself. Uh, this is something uh, that's recorded in the Encyclopedia of Jewish Religion. This is not something just made up. This is a real thing that many people study. Well, well not really too many, uh, unfortunately. But this is a real thing used throughout the scriptures. And this morning, I, I just want to make sure that we all are, are all aware of this idea of agency. That people can represent God. So that when people come across uh, scriptures like John chapter 20 verse 28 or Hebrews 1 verse 8, we can have an understanding that, hey, Jesus, maybe he, maybe he really isn't God, but he is just a representation of God. And again, <laughs> this idea of Jesus representing God, he was not the only one. Many people in the Old Testament represented God as well and were given the title of God as well. And so Jesus is the ultimate, he is the supreme agent of God. He is the ultimate representation uh, of who God is. And we should do our best as, as Christians, as Christ followers, to follow in the example of Jesus and be a representation, be an image, be an agent of God unto those we come into contact with. When, when, when people look at us, when people look at us as children of God, they should see some of God's qualities in us. Obviously, we're not going to have infinite power. We're not going to have infinite knowledge. We're not going to have the, the love to the fullness of God and His patience and so forth. But when people look at us, when people at our jobs, our friends, people, our, our family, when people look at us, they should see that we are somewhat a representation of God. They should see that we are agents of God and that we provide... Uh, a decent image uh, of who God is. They should see God's love in us. They should see God's patience in us. They should see God's joy in us and so forth. 
And so this coming week, uh, I would encourage you all to focus on this idea of agency and to focus on yourselves so you can be the best agent of God that there is today. That you can be the best representation of God that your co-workers will ever see. That you can be the best representation of God that your family will ever see. That you'll be the best representation of God that anybody who comes into contact with you will see. So again, put, this, put your focus this upcoming week on being an agent of God and representing God as we are all children of God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your love that you pour out unto us. Uh, Father, I thank you for uh, the example of your son, the, the, the image of you, the representation of who you are. But I just pray that, that we can come away with an understanding of who you are, who your son is, and that we can realize the distinction there. And, and Father, I just pray that we ourselves, that we can be representations of you, that, that we can uh, be a light on the hill, that we can share your love unto the people that we come into contact with on a daily basis. And so, Father, I just ask that you be with your children here. I pray that you encourage us and, and motivate.